Hi there, and welcome to our webinar about learning outside the classroom. Uh, today, I'm Jen, and I also have Erin with me, and we're both education specialists at Prodigy. I was a K through six music teacher. And I was a kindergarten through grade six homeroom teacher. So what we do as education specialists at Prodigy is we make the questions that you see in the game as well as video lessons and we're also in charge of making sure that our questions are properly aligned with your state standards. Today we're super excited to be talking about some cross-curricular learning that can be found outside the classroom in your everyday lives. We know that this year has been unpredictable and challenging for learning with distance, in-person, and hybrid models. So we wanted to provide some ideas that are accessible for everyone. So you must be thinking, why is this relevant to me as a parent? Um, I send my kids to school. Well, since students are spending so many hours every day online, um, it, it would be nice to have learning opportunities that did not involve a lot of screen time and a lot of Zoom time. So our goal today is to empower you and your families to find these opportunities in your everyday lives that don't involve screen time. And we know that learning happens in our everyday lives and that students learn through experiences. So that means it doesn't have to be in the classroom. It doesn't have to be over Zoom. Uh, we'd also love to share some practical activities that are accessible to everyone and are easily incorporated into your life. And we'd also encourage everyone to break away from what we consider to be traditional learning where students are in a classroom and there's a teacher up front talking. So during this webinar, we might ask you to think of some examples that are relevant to your family. I want you to remember that there are no wrong answers or thoughts around learning. These activities that we'll share, they will be able to be done in your own home without purchasing additional materials. And learning as you move through life is realistic and applic applicable and it encourages problem solving and critical thinking in students. So encouraging children to ask questions and find the answers instead of just telling them. So we are going to ask you now to picture your home in your mind. Jen and I will do the same. Since we're not all together, we can show some learning opportunities that Jen and I found in our own homes. So let's start with the living room. So the first thing that Jen has in her living room is this nice bookshelf. Let's take a look. So there are many activities that can be done with books other than just reading. Although of course, reading is very important. For example, students can turn a story into a script for a play and perform it to their families. They can also design a new cover for a book that they've read or write a new synopsis for the back of the book that highlights their favorite part. What we're going to do today is to focus on a verb activity. This incorporates both ELA and physical education. When a book is read aloud, every time your child hears a verb, they can act it out. As an extension, they can then write their own short story and have family members act out that verb. Today, we're gonna to do an example together. Jen will read a short paragraph from the book, Peter and the Wolf. And as she reads, we have some images of our friendly prodigy educators, pets, and family members acting out these verbs. For those of you who are not familiar with Peter and the Wolf, the narrator tells a children's story while the orchestra illustrates it, introducing students to the different instruments of the orchestra. It was composed by Sergei Prokofiev and is a staple of many children's field trips to the symphony. In this story, Peter is friends with a duck and is warned by his grandfather about a wolf that hangs out nearby. Let's do some reading. The poor duck did not see the wolf until it was too late. Then she waddled off as fast as she could and flapped her wings madly trying to fly. But the wolf ran fast and faster. He came closer and closer and was almost upon her when he pounced. And with one big gulp, 
he swallowed the duck whole. Don't worry though, the story ends with Peter catching the wolf and the duck still alive and quacking inside the wolf's belly as represented by the oboe in the orchestra. So heading back into the living room, let's look at the next object. We can see this blanket. I'm sure that many of you have a blanket, a towel, or a sheet at home that you can use for these activities. So here we have a blanket, um, or you can use a duvet or any sort of sheet. And first of all, we're teaching children life skills and responsibility. We can turn a mundane chore like folding sheets or making your bed or folding laundry into something more exciting and educational. So some questions that come to mind just with this, with my blanket is how many times can you fold the blanket? And what shapes do you see as you fold the blanket? How many different shapes can you make with the blanket? So scrunching it up or pulling it um, and stretching it. What is the smallest shape you can make? What is the largest shape you can make? And for older students, how can we find the area of the blanket? What about the perimeter? Some of the other things you could talk about are maybe if your blanket has patterns on it, talk about the patterns on the blanket. Uh, you could use the blanket as a measuring tool to measure other items around the home. And then another one is perhaps calculating the cost of the blanket and then using it to compare to others online. The blanket with its folding would also be a great activity to do around fractions. So the next activity that we have in the living room is this vase with some flowers in it. Let's take a look. So there are lots of math tasks that can be done with a vase. The first one is calculating the volume. Older students can experiment with liquid volume, whereas younger students can compare how much liquid can be held in two different vases. This works really well if they're different shapes. Pouring the water back and forth between these vases can be a very fun, if a little bit wet, activity. Another activity is estimating how many solid objects can fit into the vase. Beans, pasta, beads, or whatever you have lying around your house, they're all great options for this. If there are flowers in your vase, or if you have seeds and dirt and, dirt and can plant something, this is a great way to learn about the life cycles of plants. Students can research and take care of their own plants remembering them to water them regularly and help them grow. It's also always fun to look at a book to discover the names of flowers you have in your home. Flowers can also be a great inspiration for artwork. Let's head back to the living room. So there are some other objects in our living rooms that can be great learning opportunities. So for example, the first picture is a rectangular rug that I have. The pattern on the rug might inspire some more artwork. Young children can find the pattern with the colors or even trace their line, trace the lines on the rug with their fingers to practice their fine motor skills. Older children may be interested to find the area of the rug, the perimeter of the rug, or try and find another place in the home where the rug might fit perfectly. If you have more than one rug, this is a great time to compare shapes, sizes, or area. The next item in my home is a fireplace. This could inspire some discussion about wood, wood burning versus gas fireplaces. What's the difference? How does the fire start in each case? Older students might also be interested to talk about materials that conduct heat. Are there items in your home that might get really warm when placed next to the fireplace? Would it be a good idea to put those items next to the fireplace or not? They may also be interested in observing the flame height and how long a fire might last. This would also be a great opportunity to start talking about fire safety in the home. The third object I took a picture of is very simple, a tissue box. Tissue boxes can be great for building towers and making instruments such as guitars. Children may be interested to find the volume of the box or estimate how many tissues might fit inside. They may try and figure out how companies fit the most tissues in the box in order to really maximize the space inside. This is also a great entry point for, to 3D shapes that are made up of 2D shapes. The tissue box could be cut on the edges and opened up to form a net. There really are so many opportunities with everything that you can find in your home. 
let's move on to the kitchen. All right, so the kitchen is probably my favorite room in the home. Um, and that's because that's where the food is. So looking in Erin's kitchen, um, she's got this lovely fruit bowl with some fruit in it. So let's see what we can do with this. Okay, so a fun activity that can be done with fruit is fruit bowling. In this activity, students use whatever fruit is lying around the house and they can conduct an experiment. They can predict which fruit will roll the quickest, the slowest, in a straight line, or whatever other questions they might have. After they conduct the experiment, they can form conclusions about why that is. Older students might relate it to the mass of the fruit, whereas younger students might talk about shapes. For example, round shapes tend to roll farther than fruits with other shapes, like bananas. Fruit is also great for sorting activities such as comparing fruit by mass, circumference, length, shapes, etc. It may, it might be fun for older students to try and calculate the circumference of a fruit or experiment with their kitchen scale to see which fruits have a greater or smaller mass. One last fun extension for fruit is to see where in the world the fruit comes from. When I was teaching, we would collect the stickers that come on fruit and put them on a map so that students could visualize how far that piece, that piece of fruit traveled in order to reach their home. This might end up being a great math question too. How far did the fruit travel to reach you? And then when you were done with it, how far does the peel or the core travel after you eat it in order to reach the compost facility or wherever its final destination might be? So back in the kitchen, thanks Erin. Um, the next picture we have uh, in Erin's kitchen is a notepad and pen. And you might have one lying around on a counter or one on a fridge, or maybe you make your grocery lists on your phone. Either way, it's let's see what learning opportunities are available here. So for a task like creating a grocery list, we could totally get children involved. The adult could list off everything that they need that day or that week from the grocery store and younger students can practice sounding out and writing down the items on to the list. Perhaps even asking children what items should go on the list and why. Some questions that come to mind include, you know, predicting how much each item will cost and then comparing it to the actual cost. Have a discussion. Were you right? Were you off by a lot? Or were you pretty accurate? What surprised you? Do your favorite snacks cost a lot more than you thought? This gives students a sense of how much things cost and can lead to other discussions around food waste, budgeting, and other related topics. Um, you could also, for older students, talk about calculating and understanding tax. It is a very real way of understanding how that works. Um, you can also sort by the quantity of each item needed. And then as a super fun activity, younger kids can accompany the adult to the grocery store and match the words to the items. So if you're looking for apples, where might we find the apples at the grocery store? Let's head back to the kitchen for one more activity. All right, the third picture is a lovely picture of my trash can, recycling bin, and compost bin. You may have something similar, or maybe you don't, and now is the perfect time to set them up with the help of your students. So this is a really great um, sort of topic to, to discuss at home. It leads us to activities around composting and recycling. It's an important opportunity for students to learn how to sort the different items into the correct bins. I know from personal experience, when I first started recycling and composting, there was a lot of confusion around which items go where. Taking the initiative and seeking out the information from your municipality or city is a great way for students to learn about composting and recycling properly. Talk about why we do this. So students could research the impact of waste on our communities and our earth. Where does our waste go? For a more hands-on activity, 
take a look at your recycling bin and think of ways we could reuse or repurpose some of the items. Do you have toilet paper rolls in there or a tissue box like Erin mentioned earlier, which you could make into a guitar? What about bottles? What else can we do with these items? Finally, brainstorming ways to reduce the amount of waste that your family produces is a great way to learn while making a difference in the world. This could mean bringing reusable bags to the grocery store or using reusable bottles or cups or buying secondhand items and donating used goods. We'll head back to the kitchen and looking for some more opportunities in the kitchen. Um, the kitchen is great for, it's, it's filled with opportunities to develop life skills. So the first picture here, I have my oven set to bake, though it's not quite at 350 degrees yet, but students can learn about temperatures and baking. How does the temperature affect what you're baking? How does the heat react with the ingredients in your cookies or cupcakes? The next picture, um, I also have some measuring cups, which is another great tool when cooking or baking. Students can learn how to measure liquids and talk about volume. It's also a great way to visualize fractions. So for example, how much is a quarter of a cup? Look at a quarter of a cup versus a whole cup. Finally, I have a picture of a little yogurt cup that I had for breakfast this morning, and I've turned it around so you can see the nutrition facts. This is a great opportunity for students to learn how to read nutrition labels. What do the numbers mean? What's the serving size? Comparing two or three foods to one another. Does one food you know, contain more calcium than another? What about sugar and protein? You can talk about what it is that's important to your family when it comes to making food decisions. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of connecting learning to real world experiences. Real world experiences allow students to practice concepts and skills. It makes them more relevant and less theoretical. So for example, if you're looking at a 3D shape on paper and calculating the volume, it's very different than holding a 3D shape in your hands and trying to calculate the volume. So there have actually been studies that have shown that students who engage in these kind of learning opportunities outside the classroom have more motivation. They can remember the material more clearly and their academic, academic performance actually increases. Allowing students to explore these real tangible activities allows them to focus on what they're interested in. And we know that when students are interested, they become engaged and this leads to real life experiences that they can learn from. This can also encourage further exploration and research such as looking into or researching related real world issues. Since problems are open-ended, it's really about the process versus the final product. So students develop problem solving and critical thinking skills through these open-ended problems, fostering a love of learning. This also helps develop children's grit and perseverance, which lead to a growth mindset. And research has shown that when children believe they can grow and improve, they keep going even when the work gets hard. Kids with growth mindsets show constant improvement where kids with fixed mindsets tend to stay the same. And if you'd like to read up more on growth mindset, we highly recommend checking out the work of Joe Bowler and Carol Dweck. Um, they cite a lot of cool studies around fixed and growth mindsets. Finally, another a final benefit of connecting learning to real world experiences is the ability to create multiple entry points for students. And what this does is it makes learning more accessible and differentiated because we know that each student is unique and has their own interests and are really on their, they're all in different places along their learning journey. And connecting learning to their world allows them to learn in a way that's relevant and engaging for them. So we just quickly wanted to mention that Prodigy has released some calendars over the past year that provide lots of prompts and learning opportunities similar to the tasks that we've talked about today. 
So there's currently a March calendar out. Don't worry, even if you didn't start it at the beginning of the month, there are lots of activities and ideas that you can go back and explore. It doesn't have to be done on a certain day. So in the description box below is a link to our blog where you can find even more activities and resources to, to use with your family. Thank you so much for attending our webinar today.